All right, it's Johnny Jet, and this is my 39 travel questions. And I'm with Leo Laporte, the tech guru, the tech guy, anything, hey, well, anything to do with tech. And uh, I've been very fortunate to be a guest on his Saturday show, sometimes Sunday, 1230 Pacific. You're not a guest. Pacific. You're on all the time, 1230 Pacific, 330 Eastern. You're, the reg you're a regular. It's been over five years, maybe six. Isn't that awesome? And you probably don't even remember this far back because um, I've been, I was doing tech TV in 2003 or four, 2004. You would go to Canada. Toronto. I would go to San Francisco. Oh. Then I'd go to Vancouver, yeah. and then I'd go to Toronto. I don't. You're right. I don't remember you coming to San Francisco. What show were you on? That was the very first time. I was. Uh, it was the tech guy. It was, no, it was the... Um, Screensavers? Nope. Call me, for help? Call for help. Oh. So, see, I thought Amber MacArthur introduced us, but I knew you before. Nope. I knew you way before Amber MacArthur. Oh. You introduced right. me to her. How did we meet? I was... I actually had a book published in 2004 oh. and the, um, the, the co-author, he arranged the whole interview nice. and I was like, sure, I'll go up there. And um, anyway, then you, you asked me back many times. So I went, I was up there at least four times, I think. Very nice. And then I went to Vancouver to see you to do I the show. That, I blanked that whole era out. <laughs> well, that's why I said you probably don't remember because. It, <laughs> no, now that you mention it. No, that's good to know. Yeah, that was a fun show. I like doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you're I'm not, not going to try to change the view on this. There we go. We'll do this. Um, so anyway, let's just jump into it. I don't want to take all your time. I got nothing to do, Johnny. <laughs> I'm quarantined. In fact, I apologize for this mess back here. This is my uh, nascent mask making workshop. I got a sewing machine. I got all the tools there, and uh, but I have ordered a work a work desk, a, a workbench, a six foot workbench that's going to go here, and then it'll be much tidier behind me. I, I actually had a recliner in here and a bigger TV. This was my this was my TV uh, man cave. I said, screw that. I got rid of the TV. I got rid of the recliner. I'm making masks. Good what, job. You want to see them? I got some good ones. I'm getting good at this. I'd love to see him. So, uh, you know, today's May 1st, 2020. How are you doing with the whole quarantine? Happy May Day. Uh, I think that's one of the ways I'm handling it is, uh, is uh, learning a new skill, making masks, doing a lot of cooking. I make crumpets every day. Crumpets? <laughs> yeah, I'm getting so fat. Yeah, because it turns out, so everybody's doing sourdough, right? Because you can't get yeast in the store. So uh, I'm, I made a, I've actually had a sourdough starter for my whole life but I kind of reinvigorated it back in January of all things. And it turned out I was really glad I have it, but I don't know if you ever done sourdough. One of the things you do, you feed it every day because you have to keep it growing. It's a live thing. So you're giving it flour and water every day, but as a result, it gets bigger, and bigger, and bigger. And I just been throwing it out. They call it the sourdough discard, but it turns out it makes the best crumpets you ever have. Wow. Yeah. You know what? I got to tell Natalie because she's been baking and that's why I'm gaining weight, but she, uh, She's like, I can't get flour. And you know, she hasn't even thought about sourdough, I don't think. Well, you can't get flour and you can't get yeast. So my trick on the flour is to make my own. I have a, uh, I bought, again, this was ages ago. I got a, a German flour grinding thing. It's a beautiful work of art. It's a Wolfgang. And, uh, and so you buy, and there's no, by the way, there's no shortage of wheat berries. People don't grind their own flour that much. So you can't get ground flour, but you can get your own wheat berry. I buy 25 pound, pound sacks from uh, Amazon or 50 pound, and then you just grind it up as needed. So I have fresh ground, whole wheat. I actually use spelt, the German dinkel, which is a really nice, very digestible flour, and it's whole wheat, and it makes a wonderful crumpet. Well, we're going we're, we're gonna to have to take this one offline. I'll have to tell my wife because I, I, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Wait, you will eat them. They are the problems. That, you get one cup of uh, discard every day if you feed your uh, your starter a cup. So I get a cup each day that makes four crumpets. That's too many. That's four too many. <laughs> uh, Nelly makes cookies every day, pretty much, because Jack likes to bake. But anyway, let's talk travel because traveling, man. We can't so travel, but I'm stuck here. But my mind is always thinking about it because I love to travel. Good. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? 
Born in New York City in Manhattan, my parent, my dad was a graduate student at Columbia. Parents, uh, dad got a job at Brown University when I was two, moved to Providence, uh, Rhode Island, Pawtucket first, then Providence. Grew up there for most of my, uh, un, you know, K through, K through uh, nine. And then in the ninth grade, we moved to, my dad got a job at the University of California, Santa Cruz. So we went from stayed New England to 1971 crazy hippie Santa Cruz, California. Wow. Culture would, shock, but I never went back. I loved it. So. And where'd you go to college? Uh, well, then I did go back to New England for college. I went to Yale. But I, uh, but I only went there for a few years because I found the campus radio station, and that was it on my academic career. I became a radio junkie, and I've been doing radio ever since. I love radio. And what was your major, by the way, at Yale? Chinese studies. What was it? <laughs> Chinese. I love that, though. I, you know, so you have to take a language, right? And first I took uh, ancient Greek, and that was really too hard. So, <laughs> so then I took Chinese because I thought, well, this will be useful. They had Nixon. Was, this was 1970. 70, no, no, 1973 or 74. So Nixon had just opened China. So I thought, oh, this will be a good thing to know Chinese. I bet you the Chinese are going to go places. So, and then I fell in love with the culture and the, and the history. And it's just, it's incredible. I so do you speak it. Mandarin? Well, I did. I studied it. Yeah, I don't remember. You know, I don't oh, speak. my gosh. I we were in China a few years ago. I took my son there. And uh, I could kind of, you know, I'd be listening. And I kind of understand what they're talking about. But I could definitely couldn't join in. Wow. It's a hard language to write, but it's actually a very easy language to learn. And so uh, I loved it. I just loved it. I'm a, but that's, but you know, my dad got me into travel because when we were, when I was in fifth grade, he, uh, he was a professor at Brown. He got, so they, you know, the best deal about being a professor is you get something called sabbatical every seven or 10 years, you get to take a year off and he got a sabbatical, take the summer off to go to Europe and, and, and meet with geologists. He was a geologist in Europe. And so we went, the whole family went for the summer in 1967. Uh, we sailed there on the SS United States. And we sailed, then we spent the summer driving around. We got a Volkswagen at Wolfsburg in Germany and we drove all over Europe. And we sailed back on the Queen Mary, the second to last voyage of the Queen Mary, the one in Long Beach down the road. Wow. Yeah. And What's the SS United States, by the way? Is that that's actually docked? I think in New York. It was at the time the fastest ocean liner, transatlantic ocean liner. Beautiful ship. Yeah, Not military. No, 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 no. It was. A, it was a. This was back in the day when you had transatlantic travel. Right. You know, some people didn't want, still didn't want to fly even in the '60s. So there was, there were transatlantic ocean liners, and I. That's what really gave me the travel bug. Was that summer of 67 in Europe. My dad, I, I still thank him because he got me traveling and I never stopped. And he got me in love with boats too. I love ocean liners and cruisers. Well, you just answered my next question, which was, what's your earliest travel memory? So I assume that was it. Well, yeah, I mean, we used to, you know, we traveled uh, in the U.S., but this was the first out of the country and it was something, something, man. Oh, geez, I loved it. How many countries do you think you've been to? I, I know because, because I knew you were going to ask me this, because I thought, <laughs> how am I going to know this? I have this thing. This is uh, from the, a company called the Travelers Collective in Canada. And um, they make, uh, so it's a silly thing. It's kind of pricey given what it is, but they stamp these rings and you get a ring for each country. And then the gold rings are continents, right? <clears throat> so I counted. That's 54 countries I've been to in my, in my life. And, and how many continents? Uh, six. I Antarctica. We going to an Antarctica, I was on a South America cruise with Waz, the guy who uh, founded Apple Computer, Steve Wozniak, and we were going to take a flight to Antarctica with a cruise. And we were in Ushaya. Okay. And and, uh, and the, do the Drake and Passage. It was an ex yeah. Well, yeah, but you don't sail it. You, you fly it. it. Wow. <laughs> well, that's the theory, and it was an excursion uh, from the cruise, but. Uh, you know, so we all go, we're all bundled up in our heavy duty, you know, Antarctic clothing with our camera gear and everything. And we arrive at the airport and then the guy with a sad face comes out with a map and he says, no, I'm sorry, we can't do it. Uh, the weather isn't good. And I said, have you, okay, do you, how often do you get, well, I said, have you ever gone, to, have you ever got, has this excursion ever made it to Antarctica? He said, no. Are you joking? <laughs> So what, what, what year is what year is this? Uh, oh, it's about 
eight years ago, seven years. Uh, that's not recent. So why do you sell it? Well, we hope. So instead, we're going to take you. Actually, it was okay because instead, we're going to take you to Torres de Pains, which is the beautiful Ar uh, Argentina. Is it Argentina or Chile? Anyway, it's a mountain. It's beautiful, beautiful national park. We then you still fly there, uh, and but we're all bundled up in you know forty below clothing, except was. He goes, yeah, okay, and he takes off, and he's always wears shorts. He takes off his. He's wearing shorts. He's ready to go. So, but that was a really. A nice alternative, but I still haven't made it to Antarctica. So it's good. You know, you should always have something on your bucket list. I agree. Do you have a favorite American city? That's a tough one. I really love New York, I think. That's where I was born, but I still am in love with Manhattan. I, I, I guess. But, I, you know, then there's New Orleans, which is awesome. We went to, we, we went to when our, our 49ers were in the Super Bowl, not this past time, but the time before that. Uh, I took my wife, who's a big Niners fan. Uh, to New Orleans for the Super Bowl. That was a great trip. We lost, but it was a really great trip. Uh, so New Orleans, New York. I love San Francisco. That's my home. You know, that's where we are. We're north of San Francisco. And what a great, used to be anyway, a great city. It's kind of gone downhill now that the tech companies are all there and this is huge income disparity. There's people sleeping on the streets and then there's super wealthy people. And it's kind of sad because it used to be you know, the greatest, cutest, quaintest little fishing village in the world. I just loved it. But so it's kind of running and going off my list. New York and New Orleans. So I, love it. I thought you were going to say San Francisco. So it's interesting. Um, it's gone downhill. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't it's... recommend people go anymore. Wow. That is really they shocking. All their problems, you know, it's really too bad. Um, but that's the way it is. Sometimes cities go through uh, stages, you know. How about, about international? Like, international. You know, we were in Jerusalem this uh, last year, and it was really amazing. But I think Paris has still got to be. That seems to be winning every <laughs> every time I ask that question. How about um, where do you think the friend where do you think the friendliest people in the world are? Oh, that's a good question. I would say anybody in the Middle East. Uh, uh, they're very, very friendly in the Middle East. Sometimes they're a little hard sell friendly, too friendly. Come in, have some tea. I'll sell you a carpet. I still have a guy. <laughs> from Turkey, who calls me every year, says, I'm in town, you want to buy a carpet? No. <laughs> <laughs> but that's but they're the most warmest, hospitable people. So I'd have to say, uh, boy, I mean, what the thing about travel that's so great, and you know this, everybody watching probably does, is you realize people are great everywhere. You know, sometimes people say, oh, New Yorkers are horrible, or Parisians are horrible. No, I love New Yorkers. I love Parisians. I haven't gone anywhere where I haven't found the people to be wonderful, warm, embracing. Barcelona, Athens. Um, but I, say, I think the tradition of hospitality in the Middle East is so strong uh, that, you know, that's just, they, they want to give you the shirt off their back. And, right. And, I, you know, growing up, I was afraid to go to the Middle East because you, you know, you hear the news. And against it. It's terrible. Yeah. But and the then Muslim you go and you're like, oh my God, I feel safer here than I do at home. Absolutely. The Islamic tradition is really uh, welcoming to, to uh, outsiders. It's really great. How about which country do you think has the meanest immigration officers? <laughs> Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I've been also... everywhere in Canada. <laughs> Those Mounties, you know, you think, oh, look, the red outfit, the hat, they ride a horse, you know. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. No, Mounties are tough. They're not mean, but they're, they're tough. Again, that's almost everyone says Canada, including myself. Right off the top of your head. And my wife's Canadian. Yeah. Uh, how about, is there any place you have no desire to go to? No, I want to go everywhere. I'm scared. There's places I'm scared of. I'm dying to go to India. I've never been to India, uh, but I'm scared of it. I'm Why? I'm scared. Um, I don't want to, there are illnesses there that we don't have any <laughs> protections against. I, I have many friends who've, who've gotten deathly ill. Uh, Deli belly. Yeah, well, not just deli belly, but malaria and cholera and all sorts of, there are problems, you know, illnesses. Uh, I'm, I'm scared of it, uh, but that's dumb, right? I should that's go. Dumb. I'm dying for to go. The, for that reason, that is dumb. I yeah. mean, again, and, you were afraid to go to the Middle East, and then you realized how it's, exactly. you're going to be the same way with India. I've been well, in India a couple wait. times and never had a problem, knock on wood. Right. I can't but you just got to watch what you eat. And, and I drink. just finished the most wonderful novel about India called Shantaram, which I recommend to everybody. And that's made me die to go. Now all I do is drink chai all the time. I'm drinking chai. So I think I better go to India. It's, it's, it's going to be time when this whole thing is over. Yep. Um, 
do you have a favorite airline or favorite aircraft type? Uh, I really, I miss the old 747s. I really like upstairs, downstairs. Um, my best experience was probably SAS, the Scandinavian Airlines on a beautiful 747 when we went to uh, Copenhagen, my son and I, and they upgraded us to first class. They had, I don't know if they still do this, this was 10 years ago. They had chefs with chef hats who would come around with a smorgasbord. They had the bathroom. I've never been on a, such a big bathroom in my life. The bathroom is bigger than this. It was huge. They had flat, fresh flowers in it. Uh, it was a very lovely experience on a SAS, but you know, there's great airlines. There's so many great airlines. They are, you know, I'd never, I've never been on, I didn't even realize they had a 747. I've never been on their 747. Well, and, and again, they may not anymore. Who knows? You know, times are changing. You can't get on an A380 anymore. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Especially now. Have you ever sat next to any famous celebrities? No. 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 Now, you told me you were going to ask me that. And I have been looking in my, searching in my attic of my brain and I, no. I haven't. Isn't that weird? I don't sit up front that often. So Leo Laporte, you don't sit up front. Come on. I, you know, if I can afford it, I do. But honestly, uh, you know, for instance, we went to, to Australia, and uh, I had been to Australia once uh, uh, with a, a group of photographers, and they arranged for me to sit up front, which was very nice. By the way, Qantas, lovely airline. I love the jammies. But uh, then we came. Then when I took the family, it was too expensive. So Lisa and Michael and I uh, flew economy. And I thought, you know, I know it's a long flight. This isn't that bad. It's okay. So the difference in price, I'm, maybe I'm just cheap. But no, I mean. You get the upgrades. So you don't have to pay for it. But I don't get the upgrade points. And it's expensive. It's crazy expensive. <laughs> Although the price now has dropped. Not even, this is just right oh, before yeah. pre-COVID too. I wish I could go somewhere now. <laughs> yeah, well, even before that. But I mean, you know, it used to be $18,000 of flying right. first class to Australia and Right. You know, coach would be a 1500. Now there's fares to under 500 sometimes around trip coach. I, I got to, I keep saying, I got to subscribe to the Johnny Jet air travel uh, deals uh, newsletter because that is the thing is, I am not in a position to do what you recommend, which is to just up and leave at any time, right. which is not that flexible. I have, it takes me because I have so many shows and I have to pre record stuff. It takes me months of planning right. to take a vacation. So I can't just up and go and finish one. Uh, that's why I'm going to retire someday and that'll be, man, I'll be out of here. <laughs> bye bye. Do you have a favorite U S airport? I think our San Francisco airport is pretty darn nice, especially that new terminal uh, Two, terminal two. Yeah. Old Virgin America terminal. Yeah. And the AA. Terminal two is spectacular, but I have to say, uh, airports are getting nicer everywhere. In fact, we were in New York, um, there is a, I can't remember whose lounge it is. It might be Delta's, where they have an outside deck. That's Delta. That's incredible. Yeah. That is really a nice lounge. So I think it just depends on the terminal, the lounge, where you are. But uh, in general, I suppose, great. Atlanta is a nice, Hartsfield's nice. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of, the airports are getting better, aren't they? They used to just really. Without a doubt. I mean, especially LA, they're bringing in local food, shops, okay. although LA traffic's LA, terrible. Incredible, yeah. There's another one. When are they going to bring back that that restaurant with the, and the, the counter encounter? Yeah, I, you know I don't know if they're ever going to. There's I've been talk been about it. Yeah, you see it as you drive in. It's, yeah, it's, it's iconic, but yeah, it's like they're talking. They're actually talking about maybe making it a hotel, which would be really cool. It's like it's uh, like me. It's iconic but empty. How about international airport? Hmm, I hate Heathrow. Actually, I was very disappointed in Dubai Airport. Uh, cause there wasn't anywhere good to sit and we got there early and you have to, you can only be there three hours ahead of time, which was crazy. Cause I'm used to getting there early for international flights. What's my favorite international airport? I think ski pole in the Amsterdam. In Amsterdam. You spend a lot of time there cause it's a transit point. Uh, but I like that. I think ski pole is probably my favorite. You know, I interviewed yesterday, uh, Andrew McCarthy and mm -hmm. he gave two answers so far that you've given. He said New York city for the friendliest people. And he also said Amsterdam. Yeah, it's a really nice airport. And you spend a lot of time there, that in Frankfurt, because you're transiting. It's a lot of the airlines use it. But yeah, Ski Pole's a nice airport. And do you have a favorite airport lounge? I think now that 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 that, that was the last time I was in an airport lounge was at Delta. Uh, lounge JFK? In I, I love the open deck. The planes are going over. It's a little, you know, diesel-y, but it's still, it's nice. To, if it's a nice day and you, they have good food and you go and you sit out there and they have Nice big kind of lounging armchairs. I thought that was pretty nice. It's the nicest lounge I can remember. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in uh, in lounges in, 
in those transit cities in Heathrow and Ski Pole and Frankfurt. But uh, I think I think that New York Delta. Yeah. How about do you have a favorite hotel? Yeah, uh, my favorite hotels are not big hotels. And we've stayed at some very fancy hotels. When we were in Dubai, uh, most recently, uh, we stayed uh, at the Raffles Dubai, which I was in love. It's a pyramid. And it's not in a good location. So it's fairly cheap for a Dubai hotel. They must have built it when that was going to be the hot area. And then, then, then it turned out not to be. So it's not, But it is near the, the, the uh, subway stop. So that's convenient. And the, they have a most amazing a Japanese restaurant on the roof that has a beautiful view. It's, it's a lovely hotel, but it's a very, you know, it's kind of a fancy hotel, but I think that was the most hospitable, nicest stay we've had in a long time. But I also really love the little uh, hotels, the bed and breakfasts in Paris. And there's one on Ile Saint Louis, which is my, if I, if my favorite place to stay in Paris is Ile Saint Louis, which is a very, quiet upscale island right next to Ile de la Cité and next to Notre Dame but it's quiet because it's residential and there's a little hotel there called a, I don't I shouldn't say the name I'll never get in again the Hotel Jeu de Palme it's an old tennis court from uh you know the days of the Louis that they turn into a little bed and breakfast and uh it's quiet you go out there's a it's a beautiful street you would never know you're in one of the biggest, most metropolitan cities in the world. It's fantastic. And you're within walking distance of everything. You just go across the bridge and there you are. So don't tell anybody, but that's my favorite. That sounds pretty good right about now. I know. I want to go. I know. How about a favorite beach island? How about island and beach? So disappointed because in January of next year, we were going on an Asia cruise, which we, I decided to cancel because it just didn't seem like a good idea at this time. Uh, but we were going to be going to the Palawan in the Philippines. And I haven't been there yet, but I think had I, I think you, if you asked me in February after this trip, I would have said Palawan from what I've seen, what everybody said. I, I, Is that so Cebu? Sad. Cause I, I've never, I've never been to the Philippines. Yeah. So sad. Yeah. It's um, well, I, you know, I don't know because I've not been either, uh, but I've, everything I've seen and been told, I'll tell you how beautiful it is. They uh, have a bunch of new Apple screensavers in the Apple TV, and a lot of them are from the Palawan wow. <laughs> in beautiful clear water. Uh, I really enjoyed Bondi Beach just because it's Bondi Beach. Um, in Sydney. Yeah, in Sydney. Uh, where, where else? What other beaches do I really like? I think my favorite beach, uh, and this goes back a long ways, and I don't know if it's still as deserted as it was, but you know, when you're on a cruise in uh, the Caribbean, you always go to St. Thomas and the Virgin Islands. And this, the cruise side of the island is just crazy touristy, yucky. And this, was in, this goes back to the 80s. But if we took a crazy jitney ride over to the other side of the island, and at that time, fewer people went there. So the far side of St. Thomas, it's the island, it's the beach of your dreams. Sugary white sands, palm trees, nobody was there crystal blue water, warm water. I really do love the beaches in the Caribbean. I think they're fantastic. That sounds even better right now. <laughs> I know. And probably now it's been discovered. And I mean, this was 50, 40 years ago or something. So yeah, I'm sure it's been now. discovered. Um, do you have a favorite restaurant? Yes. This, you know, it's funny. You, this I can say with confidence. And it's only because we... We were in Las Vegas, which, by the way, I used to love to go to Las Vegas. I hope Las Vegas comes back because I loved going to Las Vegas. We wouldn't go gamble. Although the last time we were there, Lisa got one 600 bucks on a slot machine. So maybe we will. I don't know. Um, but I had, was there for a tech conference. We used to go all the time for tech conferences. And I had been turned away from an event. They said, well, you can't come in. I was like, oh, well, okay. They turned Leo the port down? Yeah, it was a dumb thing to do. But... <laughs> Uh, Lisa and I said, all right, fine. You won't let us in. And we were at the MGM and we wandered down and said, look, this looks like a nice restaurant. It's a little thing called Joël Robichon. I did not know at the time, but he's a very famous French TV chef. Uh, it was the best meal I'd ever had. And there's two of them. There's the fancy restaurant, which you have to make reservations months ahead of time. And next to it, there's what he calls l'atelier, his workshop, which is just a, a bar. And it's wonderful. It's the best food I've ever had. The, the restaurant next to it in Las Vegas, they have a bread cart. They have a full-time baker. You must be baking nonstop. You were talking about baking. Bread cart's huge. It's this big. 
and it's all kind of brioche and croissant and every kind of beautiful French baking you've ever had in your life. And they say, what do you want? Um, one of those, one of those, one of those, one of those, one of those. It's incredible. So after that, we went to Joël Robichon in Paris. We went to Joël Robichon in Tokyo. We went to Joël Robichon in London. He had, there's a lot of them. And you'd say it's a chain, but Joël still owns, most of them have been sold off, but he still owns a couple of them. I think the, the uh, Vegas one. And were they all good? Amazing, Johnny. And my tip is don't go to the fancy sit-down restaurant. Go to the atelier and sit at the counter because the food's the same and it's mind-blowingly good. It is. And, and do you have a favorite food? You gotta have the mashed potatoes and whip them up and it's so, oh, it's not even mashed potatoes. You never had anything like it's that. butter? Uh, a lot of butter, probably all butter. It's probably no <laughs> potatoes at all. It's probably just cream and butter. Uh, what is my favorite food? There you go. I like baked goods, I guess you could probably tell. Um, I don't know. I don't fruit? Do you have a favorite fruit? Fruit? My, fa my favorite fruit is a strawberry rhubarb pie. Does that count? <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> it reminded me to I love ask fair. that question. What's your favorite dessert? So now I'm going to add that for future. Yeah, desserts are better. Fruit is a little too healthy, but I do love berries. Blueberries, I love. I can eat blueberries all day. And how about the, what's the craziest thing you've ever eaten? You know, I'm not an Anthony Bourdain type. Let's go to the, you know, street vendor and eat snake. So I, I will eat any kind of, I mean, I'm not against organ meats. In fact, I love uh, sweet breads. And so I'm, I will eat pretty much anything. The cr I don't think I've eaten anything. Cr well, okay. I was in Paris. This is many years ago. We went to a lovely old uh, bar called Le Bistro Zank or Le Bar Zank as zinc bar it was a wonderful i think it's fairly well-known bistro in paris and uh it was kind of country cooking and they had a dish that's called le ray de couchon which i i knew that means pig's ear but i thought that's probably it's probably a wonderful pastry right so i ordered a ray de couchon and it is a pig's ear it's an ear of a pig they fry it they bread it lightly, and it's like eating pencil erasers. It's the chewiest thing. It is not flavorful. So that has to be the weirdest thing I've ever eaten. Well, and did you finish it? <laughs> no, I did not. It was too chewy. It was like, it literally, like, you know those pink pencil erasers? It was like eating that. Only this big. Yeah. No. Uh, do you have a favorite uh, drink while you're flying? Or on the ground. No, I don't drink when I'm flying. I only drink water. I'm Me not an alcoholic drinker, but I drink a lot of, I love water. Um, so that's really my favorite drink. And I don't, not the bottled water, just good, delicious, pure water is fantastic. But, uh, and I, you know, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit it, but um, on, a, on a riverboat cruise, once everybody was drinking, um, what is the, it's like, it looks like orange aid. It's an, it's Orangina? An orange, yeah, it's not orange. I love orangina, but no, this is alcoholic and I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, you'll know. And I've ordered it since and it's delicious. It's an orange liqueur and they put seltzer in it. It's basically like drinking an orangina and it's alcoholic. But I, I ordered it once uh, at an event and a guy looked at me and said, you're drinking a cruise drink. And I said, yeah, I think so. So I don't order as much as I used to, but it's a delicious drink. So, um, but I'm not a big drinker. You know, I, um, we're going to do, although tonight is margarita night. We're practicing for Cinco de Mayo. I was going to say, is it every Friday night, margarita no. night? No, Lisa just, my wife, as part of our quarantine, she said, you know, we haven't had margaritas. I said, fine. Get me some oranges. Get me some limes. Get me some lemons. We've got the tequila. We've got the salt. I will make you a margarita. So we're freezing orange and uh, lemon and uh, lime uh, cubes, ice cubes. And we're going to make delicious nice. margarita. Uh, how about, do you have any favorite travel movies that maybe inspired you to travel or oh, books gosh. or so, TV shows? When we were uh, on the Queen Mary, I think, might have been uh, coming, going over on the United States. They would have, you know, there, this is 1967, entertainment. They didn't have dancing you know, they didn't have singing, but they had a little movie theater and they showed over and over again a movie that was far too adult for me. Remember, I'm, I'm, in, I'm 11 years old, but it was called Two for the Road. It was Audrey Hepburn 
and I want to say Albert Finney. I can't remember who the other guy was, but it was actually, it was a very adult movie about them driving through the European countryside. And it was them uh, first when they first met and it was madly romantic. And then it was them when they uh, went with another couple that had a kid. And then it was later in life. So there was three different road trips through the countryside of Europe. And it made a huge impact on me. I, I don't even know if you can find it anymore, but if you can't, I don't know if it's even a great movie, but as a kid, I remember thinking, that's what I want to do. I want a road trip. I want to get a, a, an MG, a little MG midget and drive around with my, with a scarf and the hair blowing, <laughs> and drive around Europe. And that's, so that made a big impact on me. And then, you know, Dr. Zhivago, Lawrence of Arabia. Um, I, I, yeah, I, movies have definitely formed my sense of travel. You know, maybe the reason I'm scared to go to India is because of Slumdog Millionaire. Maybe that's actually, maybe I'm thinking of the movie version of India. And I should yeah, say. no. Yeah. Um, Great movie, though. Yeah, it is. Actually, Natalie and I, my wife and I went and saw the movie right after we got back, like the week we got back. And then we went back to India, you know, a year or two later. So okay. that didn't affect us. Okay. Uh, t- TV show or book, travel book? Um, well, Shantaram, which I just finished, yes. if, you're, if you're interested in India, and it, it's really a novel, but it's, I think, really the guy's memoirs, because it's very close to his actual life. He escaped from prison in Australia uh, and hid in India, ended up having, leading quite a varied lifestyle, including going to Afghanistan to fight for the freedom fighters against the Soviets. And, uh, and he was, worked for a gangster. And it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful novel. And it really is a slice of India. So I think that's, that's a good one if you're interested in India. Um, before we went to Egypt, I, uh, I read some wonder, a wonderful novel uh, that took place in the time of the pharaohs. It was a fictionalized history. Uh, and I can't remember the name of it, but it was a wonderful book. I like to read novels about the place I'm going. When we were in uh, France, I read... Um, uh, what's the book about uh, the building of the cathedrals? He's written several of them since uh, 14th century. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd read uh, something like Barbara Tuckman, the historian's um, book about medieval Europe, uh, about the 14th century. And then I would read a novel um, about the cathedral building in the 14th century. Everybody listening is going, you know, yeah, you know, Leo, it's the, but I can't remember off the top of my head the name. So you prepare when you travel. I mean, you, you. I like to read books before I go there and during my visit. Absolutely. So we do audio books. So it's often an audio book. But I remember when we were in Egypt the first time, going down the Nile, listening to uh, books about Egypt. I like to do the nonfiction history too, because I'd like to understand the uh, place and the culture and the history. But I think often a novel can capture the spirit of a country in a way that a history does not. So I like to do both. So when you travel, what is the one thing you usually forget? Or you... <laughs> I've forgotten so many, forgotten so many things. Uh, although I'm, get, Lisa and I, because we travel a lot now, uh, we've gotten really good at packing. We both have noticed that we go, oh, yeah, I'm ready to go. Give me an hour, I'm ready to go. So I'm pretty good about, you know, I, we both have travel bags, you know, dop kits with all our uh, toiletries ready to go. We have travel sized everything ready to go. So, I mean, I think knock on wood, I'm pretty good. Once I think I forgot my uh, my glasses, well, that's bad, and I had is. to have them shipped out. Um, you don't carry an extra one in your bag. I always carry it. No, that you'd only do that once. Uh, <laughs> oh no, I. That's the thing. I th- I think having done this enough now, I don't think uh, there's anything that I have routinely forgotten, no. And, and what gadgets do you travel with? I mean, I have a, that's also a fairly, fairly elaborate. It's gotta be. Yeah, fairly elaborate kit. This oh. is my briefcase. And I've got all sorts of, you know, ready to go gadgets. This is one that I really recommend. It's called the Grip It. And it's a bunch of um, rubber kind of rubber band, or I'm sorry, Grid It, not Grip It. Grid with a D It. And you can put the cables in, so, the, this is so that I always have the right cables. And by the way, I am totally ready to go in a moment's notice. This cable I like, these are Nomad cables and they have three different ends. They have the Apple Lightning 
They have the type C for the Android devices. They have the old micro USB. So I only need a couple of these to know I can charge everything. And then I bring an anchor power cube with me. And usually, you know, it used to be that, uh, I, boy, I've blown fuses in some of the best hotels in Europe. It used to be that I uh, would accidentally bring the wrong voltage and really mess things up. But I've learned my lesson. The nice thing about the Anchor Travel Cube is it handles 120, 110 and 240, and you just need the right adapter, and I have a set of adapters for that. And then I plug everything into that. It has, it's, a, it's very compact. It's a nice little cube with three USB ports and then three pl regular plug sockets. And that's usually enough for me to, I mean, I do bring a lot of electronics with me. I bet. I mean, this should actually be one of the tech guy segments where we I know, actually, travel bag. And, yeah. and, you, and you show people, you actually have them out. I haven't, you know, I do. I mean, if I, I'm not going to go get it for you, but we'll, we'll have to do it another time. Yeah, another time. Cause I do have all this stuff and it's ready. It's in a drawer. There's a travel drawer in my bedroom where all the things that we need. And Lisa says, uh, you're in charge of chargers power. I said, fine, I got it all. I have one cube for her, one cube for me. They're great too, you swing them around the head, they're like maces. And I, you know, I sort of, Here you, here's your cube. And uh, she plugs it in, so each on each side of the bed, and we're all set. And I have, you know, because I wear an Apple watch, you have to bring, that's a weird charger, so you have to have that. You have to have charger for your phones. And I have two different phones. I have an iPhone and an Android phone. So you have to have the lightning and you have to have the type C. And I, so I have those. And then I bring, usually I bring a, a laptop, like a MacBook Air, or this is the, I have the most over here, the Dell uh, XPS 13, good, good little light travel thing. And then I often will bring an iPad with me too, because sometimes I like to sit by the pool. And keep What's it like going through security? Are they like... <laughs> He throws has got to be terrible. Take it all out. <laughs> yeah. You know, there are only a few things that security really has trouble with. One is big camera lenses. For some reason, if those are packed in a bag, they, want, they always want those out. And I guess it's they can't see into them. And they're just the cylinder and that scares them. And uh, the other thing they, they always seem to have trouble with is my coffee. So Lisa. Your coffee? Yeah. Lee, Lisa's a coffee snob. And so we always have to bring with us, even I say, Lisa, we're going to France, to Paris. This is the best coffee in the world. No, no. What, Lisa, we're going to Dubai. This is where coffee was, came to the world. No, no. So she'll bring an AeroPress, which is a, a very easy little coffee maker. I got her a travel one. It was kind of depressing. I realized, I guess we're not going to be using that for a while. I just got her the travel AeroPress. And then uh, she will grind like three pounds of coffee. She'll grind it ahead of time and bring it with us. Hey, there are worse people who bring grinders too. I mean, I have a friend who does a hand grinder, but wow. anyway, uh, the problem is if they know that you've got coffee in your bags, apparently we didn't know this, it's drugs. commonly used by uh, drug smugglers to hide the smell of the drug. So they go, they go through your coffee. <laughs> and I found out because one time we were traveling, Lisa said, could you carry the coffee for me? I said, well, of course, honey, I'll be glad to. Completely searched everything. The whole thing. So do you put it in your carry-on or your check bag? Carry-on, but it probably, yeah, it's worse probably in your check bag. <laughs> well, they're, they're going to open it up. But... Check bag. So, yeah, I can't break her the habit, though. She says, no, I have to have my coffee. Everything sounds fine, but I have to have my coffee. I would just pull it out separately. Yeah, just say, here, this is it. It's coffee. Yep, there it is. Feel up your coffee. Grind. I've learned that at Heathrow. Like, when I go through Heathrow, I take every electronic gadget out and put it in a separate tray otherwise they'll flag your bag and it could take yep. up to 30 minutes and that's the problem in heathrow you often have a tight transit time and they always make you go through security twice and right. oh, just a couple things. um any uh what what give me some travel apps that you use a lot well most of them i've learned from a guy named johnny jetty ever hear of him he is nope. the best man he has <laughs> turned me on to so many travel apps uh, of course TripIt pro you got to have TripIt Pro. Uh, I, I, I started using that when I was doing a lot of business travel because it would just import all your itineraries. I really like having my itinerary uh, in, on my phone. Confirmations, phone numbers. You get to the airport. You don't know where the hell you're going. You can tell the cabbie, oh, we're going here and show them. So I have a whole travel folder on here. And TripIt is right in the upper left-hand corner, the first thing you use. I just started using this thing called Polar Steps right after the quarantine happened <laughs> or just before it because I was really looking forward to using this to, um, it, it will track your steps and take the pictures that you take and put them in and create a little travel diary. 
and then you can print a book out of it. I can't it's funny because I was just cleaning out my travel apps this morning. I'm like, what am I doing with all these apps? Not just travel. And Polar Steps is right there. Yeah, I can't wait to use it. And I'm like, I can't remember. I, I, I must have talked about it on your show. Uh, yeah, I'm sure I got it from you. Then I always take uh, Google Translate's pretty good, but Bing Translator, I think, is a little bit better. So I always have the Bing Translator because you can have a conversation. You just hold the phone up and they speak and then you speak and it translates. It's amazing. So that's, that's a, a very that's a Bing translator. Yeah, the Bing translator is really, really good. You can, you can. So you uh, like that one better than the Google translator? I think, yeah, honestly, I think it's a little bit better. It's certainly a little jazzier. Okay. Uh, so uh, that's a good choice. What other travel apps? So is the Bing translator is that just for Android or you can use that? You no, can this is an iPhone. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is. They have it in both. Um, and the Google Translate's pretty good. I have them both on here, but I've I found Bing to be more useful. You told me about Lounge Buddy. I have that. Of course, Mobile Pass for getting into the country and uh, my TSA to keep track of uh, wait times. That kind of thing is very handy. You know, one thing I really like is these gypsy guides. When we were in Hawaii, this is a whole new category of software. It's software that ties to your phone and GPS. So you pair it to your car and it's like having a guy in the back seat telling you uh, about what you're seeing. And they, they had them first for um, Hawaii. And we did it, we, we drove all over Kauai. And he, on the left, you'll see the waterfalls. It's pretty funny. The guy's pretty good. And it's kind of like a weird kind of uncle in your back seat. Uh, and, and so if you're, if you're in a car, uh, it, they have it for the national parks in the US. They have it, it these are the gypsy guides. And there's a number of these. If you look for GPS tours, You'll, in your in your application store, you'll see a lot of them. But I really like these gypsy guides. Um, they're they're pretty fun. Uh, God, I mean, tra the thing, the truth is, your smartphone is the best travel companion ever. Now, I mean, I I can go out, I can drop a pin on the hotel and say I'm going walking in Paris, and I don't care where I am. I know I can always say get me back, and it'll tell you. Um, and now that they have transit built in, I used to carry City Mapper with me all the time, but now the transit's built into Google Maps, I'm golden. I, I, that's really transformed travel as far as yeah. I don't know how we traveled without the uh, exactly the phone, exactly. smartphone. Yeah. Um, down to like four questions. This is you did all thirty nine already, or almost. Yeah, boy, it didn't feel like that many. Okay, that's I'm glad to hear that. Uh, do you have a worst travel moment? Oh yeah, it just my most recent travel moment. We arrived. We're in Dubai. We've had a wonderful trip. This was a cruise. We started in Athens, spent five days in Athens, Jerusalem. We did the Suez Canal. We went to Egypt, saw the pyramids. We went to uh, um, uh, Petra in Jordan and saw the beautiful. This was an amazing trip. And in Dubai, I, uh, I said, well, I want a few days in Dubai to you know, enjoy it. This is when we stayed at that beautiful hotel, the Raffles Dubai. And, uh, and we're all done. Get in the car. Oh, it's been wonderful. We're going home. Get to the airport. There's a little, we're flying Cafe Pacific, a little commotion. The guy comes over, another guy comes over. If I say, sir, your flight was last night. <laughs> I said, what? And, and it, there was a confusion with our travel agent because she had booked us an extra night at the hotel because we had a late night flight so that we wouldn't have to check out early. But I misunderstood. I thought we, I thought we would go the day we check out. So I wasn't. If I paid closer attention, Lisa said, from now on, I'm checking in the confirmations. Okay, fine. If I paid closer attention, I would have noted. But we, I thought, we don't have to check out till Tuesday, so must, our flight must be Tuesday. No, our flight was Monday. We had an extra night so that we, anyway, that was my worst moment because here we are in Dubai. I got to get back to work. We ended up having, and we had, we had these were nice tickets, too. We had business class tickets uh, home on Cathay Pacific. Was, Via Hong Kong. Yeah, I was really looking forward to it. Um, and what'd you do? Called the travel agent, booked brand new, same night tickets. Cost me a pretty penny. I learned my so you, lo you lost that, you lost those other no show. I don't even want to say how much money it cost. Yeah. Could have bought a car. Oh my. <laughs> Please don't say it. <laughs> but I, but we had to get home and I, and I, I really didn't want to get back in the cab and go back to the hotel. So can we have another night? I just said, look, I called the travel agent. Fortunately, we had a good travel agent. They were there. And uh, I said, you got to get me out of here. And well, we flight and we were able to get home. My next question might 
that might pertain to this one, but what was your uh, most embarrassing travel That's moment? It. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my most embarrassing. We uh, uh, we were in Venice. Uh, we were going to go on a cruise out of Venice, and um, I brought the for somehow I you know I'm supposed to be the tech guy. I thought I knew what I'm doing. I brought the wrong power adapter, and we were staying in a beautiful hotel. It was an old uh, monastery, it was a thousand year old hotel in Venice. On the island. Yeah, on the island. It was in Venice proper. Yeah. Yeah, I've I've stayed at that one. Yeah, it was a gorgeous hotel. Uh, we get in. We get into the hotel. Uh, oh, I'm so excited. We plug in the stuff. Power goes out in the whole hotel. <laughs> the power blow the power. What and did the, you plug in? It was some adapter that wasn't 240. I see. What I always thought was, oh, that'll blow my adapter. What I didn't realize is it would short circuit the whole place. So the engineer comes, they, they're very kind, very nice. They fix it, they, you know, it's just a fuse, but it blew the whole, whole hotel, at least the whole floor. I don't know, although everything was dark. But I don't realize my mistake. We get, so we have a lovely visit to Venice. I always like to book a few days uh, in the, when we start so we can see the town. So we have a beautiful visit to Venice. Get on the boat, it's a seaborne cruise. We're, gonna, we're, we're leaving for Venice, ending up in Istanbul. We're gonna see all of the Greek islands. It was a wonderful trip. Get on the boat, plug in that thing. <laughs> the, the, the stateroom goes dark. I have to call down and say, uh, I don't know what happened. Our power's out. <laughs> I'm starting to I'm starting to think maybe it's me because that's twice in a row now that's happened. Uh, but I didn't figure it out for some reason. <laughs> we get to Istanbul. I get in the hotel room. Well, you know what happened. I plug in the stuff. <laughs> Again. Oh, my gosh. Three. I finally figured it out. Oh, it's this thing I'm plugging in. <laughs> so um, that was pretty embarrassing. Three times. And really, the real embarrassment is not those people. I'll never see them again. It's my wife who will never let me leave this town. I, that's what I was thinking. Yep. Uh, two more questions. Yep. You have a dream destination. I've been so fortunate to have traveled so many places 54 countries down in 54 so i feel like i've done a lot on my bucket list i would i think probably mumbai i really want to see and and of course so the taj mahal although you know you you get those places in your mind you know you get there and it's like the mona lisa you see it and you go oh so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna make a big deal out of the taj mahal i still would like to see it I would very much like to see Victoria Falls. I think my dream destination at this point is probably Africa and uh, a wildlife safari. We went to the Galapagos Islands uh, a couple of years ago, and that was amazing. It was, it was, and I thought we should do more wildlife. I want to do up the Amazon. Uh, right. I've been to Machu Picchu twice now, so that would have been on my list. That's been amazing. Uh, Angkor Wat, I'm dying to go there. We were going to get to go to Angkor Wat in January. We're not going to get to this time. Um, so there's a few, yeah, a few great, a few of the major, you know, UNESCO heritage sites, but I think I've been to more than, I've been to more than half of them and, uh, I feel very fortunate. I've seen. Well, some that's impressive. Um, how about before you tell me your best travel tip, where can people find you? What's your social media handles? Just, um, twit.tv. Uh, yeah, just go to the uh, the podcast network. It's all geek stuff, twit.tv. Of course, I'm the tech guy on the radio. That's where Johnny is on our radio show all over the uh, country every uh, Saturday and Sunday. He's on on uh, Saturdays. Um, all right. That's the best, best way. You can just search for Leo Laporte or uh, just go to twit.tv. Actually, I have a page. I put it in the in my email, uh, leo.ist, leoist. And uh, that tells you everywhere. It's got links to everything. Do you hear that noise? Yeah. That, I'm sorry about that. I, I was going to say, that's got to be you. It's me. It's, yeah. And that, it, but I feel bad about it because when that happens, everybody thinks that their phone is blowing up. And it's me. It's my phone blowing up. I apologize. <laughs> and by the way, if you guys like this, please like or subscribe to my YouTube channel. and uh, Ring the bell. Press the button. Hit, hit the like the button. Come on. I, I, we need it. <laughs> All right, Leo. <laughs> what is your best travel tip? Um, my best travel tip is get the hell out there. Don't worry about how, don't worry about spending money. 
you can go cheap, but hit the road, Jack. Get out there. The best thing you can do in your life is to travel and bring it, bring your smartphone with you so that not only you know where you are and can get home and people can reach you, but you, but most smartphones today have more than adequate cameras because you do want to document your trip. You, you don't want to spend the whole time behind the lens. So just having a good camera phone is all you really need. Well, uh, you know, I, stupid me, we, we, uh, we were on the, um, the Dead Sea floating. That's a wild experience. If you ever get to do that, you just bob. In fact, it's dangerous because you can flip over because you're bobbing like this and you flip over and then you can't get up because you're so buoyant. And you're not, so, supposed to, you're not supposed to dunk your head. I've done it they once. Say, yeah, they say, get, in fact, there's a lifeguard. Say, get, get your head, turn around, don't do that. It's dangerous. But I didn't have a camera because I thought, I don't want to get it all salty. I'm so grateful. Somebody had the worst camera ever, an iPad, but I have a blurry picture of me and Lisa the Dead Sea. And I'm so grateful to her that she had her iPad and took a picture of us. So make sure you have something to take a picture. But boy, the best travel tip is just to do it. It is this, well, the hardest thing for me about this quarantine, about this whole thing is I, I love to travel and I know I'm not going to get to travel for a while and it's hard. I love it. But this is why I'm glad you're doing this, right? Then we can all kind of get our travel experiences. Yeah. Yeah. We can Thank dream you. about it, fantasize about it, and um, hope, and relive our travels. Yeah. I fantasize all the time about moving to Costa Rica or just anywhere. But the thing is, I don't want to end up anywhere. I want to keep going. I don't want to yep. stop. We will. It's going to take a little bit of time, but we will. We all right, Leah. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. I really appreciate yeah. it. And uh, 54 Great. countries this man's yeah. been to. Yeah. Very impressive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See I you later. <laughs>